Thank you so much. Uh, hello, all of you. My name is Olga Nimanezhna. I represent uh, Swedish International Liberal Center. And today we will talk about uh, perspectives of uh, Ukrainian democracy with Paul Friges, journalist, teacher, writer, and author of the book uh, Ukraine Adrift. Hi, Paul. Shall we start? Yes. Please. Um, why did you start the project of the road trip uh, book about Ukraine? Did you say why? Yes, why? Uh, well, the reason was I thought it was a, a giant country and very unknown to most people in Western Europe. And I was curious about it, uh, not only because I've visited the country before, but also that uh, it was a country clearly drifting away from the realms of the, Soviet, uh, the former Soviet Union and Russia and trying to find a new identity more aligned with the Western European values. So it was a, a giant movement in a country, in a vast country that was uh, covering, uh, uh, it, well, it's, it's a vast country, it's, it's uh, the second biggest country in Europe. And uh, it used to have 50, uh, over 50 million inhabitants, now it's less for several reasons, but a huge, huge country drifting westwards and very unknown to, to Europe. I knew and I had a feeling, I had a hunch that it was going to be big things were afoot, big things were about to happen in Ukraine, just because of the, uh, uh, because of the, these uh, huge changes. So I was very curious for that reason. Yeah, and actually, actually this is point very interesting because it feels like uh, the majority of uh, like uh, leading countries, they're more focused on Russia than on Ukraine. And they feels like they thought that Russia is, Russia's perspective on the Eastern Europe, it's more leading and uh, the perspectives of Ukraine, Moldova and other like Eastern Europe and post-Soviet countries, it's nothing so much important. I mean, that was that point and now everything changed. Yes, now, I mean, this, uh, what happened now, of course, has turned Ukraine into the focus of, of the rest of, uh, of the world in a way that uh, we couldn't foresee. I mean, I just had a hunch that things were about to happen, but I, never, I couldn't realize that there would be a war of this scale uh, and of this uh, uh, importance were about to happen in, uh, when I started writing the book, and that was in uh, 2019. Yeah, and the thing is also that Ukraine is like, as you said, it's now it's 40 million of people, and this is the biggest like uh, for territory country in in Europe, and it's still we are like uh, feeling something like. We, we feel something new from this country and it's surprising us as well. And the question to you, what about that exactly day, on uh, 24th of February, when uh, Russia uh, invade Ukraine, like a full-scale invasion? What, what, what do you felt this way? What do you th thought about, I mean, what's going on? What was yeah, your well, first feeling? I, I never about thought, that? I didn't think uh, Vladimir Putin was going to invade uh, Ukraine because I thought it would not be rational and I viewed Mr. Putin as uh, partly or uh, at least ruled by rational instincts, even though he was guided by feelings or emotions about this uh, Russian uh, empire or the, the ambitions of a Russian empire. He was, in my view, um, a man still uh, guided by rational in, uh, uh, r rational feelings that he would realize that an invasion of Ukraine will not be successful. So I, I, I definitely did not think he was going to do full-scale invasion. I thought maybe small outbursts, but not this full-scale invasion. And I was clearly wrong uh, in the sense that he, he wasn't ruled by rational instincts, but I was clearly right that uh, it turned out to, to be as disastrous as it could be. Uh, the invasion for Russia and we, we're in the midst of this now and and for me it, the, the way it has resounded in the rest of Europe is it's not only a story of David uh, Goliath you know a small country fighting for its existence or, or uh, 
it's, it's freedom. It's also something that resonates with the rest of the world, that it's about not only sovereignty of a, a country, a smaller country, it's also about democracy, a fight for democracy. So, I mean, we're sitting here at, the, at this forum talking about democracy, which is normally about establishing uh, institutions, but it's also, in this case, actually about a war on democracy. I mean, that's a way to look at it. It's a war on democracy. It also interesting is it just not also just in general democracy. It's it's more focused on the European values and principles for Ukraine. I think. What do you think about that thing? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a classical dualism within Ukraine that it, it's, it's a, the, the, they have been talking about the the intellectuals there have been talking about the two Ukraines, one Eastern, inward-looking, uh, mystic oriental uh, or uh, orthodox style of thinking and one more western uh, oriented uh, values uh, but i think uh, yeah and this this fight is now uh, well played out uh, with weapons and with armory which is very tragic in a way because i mean uh, tens of thousands of people have died and will die and uh, since this has become such a big, uh, prestigious war for all the parties, it's unlikely to stop very soon. I mean, I think we'll, it will go on for at least, uh, you know, over the good year, uh, over a good time of next year, good part of next year, I think. And it's, I think it's also quite <coughs> an optimistic scenario, unfortunately, mm. if the war will finish uh, the next year, because it could stand like last for many, many years, actually, because of uh, resources that Russia still has, like a lot they of resources. human resources, still has uh, Soviet weapons still, and uh, some countries, like post Soviet countries, who still has also a lot of like Soviet uh, weapons as well, they could engage that more to this war. And we see now the mobilization process as well, and uh, how it works badly to Ukrainian prospect. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, we are, yeah, they still have resources to go, and but I think the strategy, as we have we have talked about this before, and uh, Olga, you told me uh, you were worried about, and you thought there were Western leaders, they didn't want to supply enough help to Ukraine, because they uh, they had a crush, you know, a secret love affair with the Mr. Putin, uh, some of the leaders, which I don't I, I don't think that's the case. My perspective is that. The, the Western powers and as I said, the EU and NATO are not, they don't want to humiliate Putin by a, a very decisive victory on the ground. They want to see him slowly bleed to death, so to speak. They want it to, to sap out so they, the Russians themselves will try to find out a story to, 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 to find a way out to say that, oh, we won anyway. Uh, in some way, you have to make up a story to make this work, and that's, I think, that's the strategy from the West: not to make a decisive victory or humiliation, uh, and to escalate it to, into a, a nuclear war, but to to keep it at a level so that it will sap the powers out of the Russian. Uh, uh, society so that the people in Russia will go out and process, can you stop this war? We need to get the economy back on its feet. So that's my, my, my notion and I think, uh, I think it's correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think, um, how has the Russian war, they changed perception of people uh, of Ukraine so far? Come again. How do you think, I mean, um, uh, the Russian war, how it changed people's perception of Ukraine so far? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, from a very, uh, uh, the perception of Ukraine and Ukrainians was very diffuse, very unclear. Uh, it was something like a, a, a Russian, but with short pants, uh, but, you know, more or less a kind of a Russian uh, or a peasant Russian, some kind. Uh, I think what it has emerged now is like a, almost like a symbolic figure of uh, a heroic figure uh, that somebody, the, the Ukrainian, uh, the typical Ukrainian is the one that is fighting uh, 
a fight for, for the whole of Europe and Europe's freedom and the freedom of uh, democratic values. So I think that will, is a change that is permanent. <laughs> So if you were a strange backwater to, in, in the views of Western Europe, all of a sudden, and to the cost of the suffering of your nation, you have emerged now as the hero, some kind of Robin Hood hero that will remain that way from now. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, let's back a little bit to your book. So you wrote your book in 2019, right? Yeah, uh, I wrote it in uh, 2019. I started research in 2018, I think. Uh, the trips uh, were two trips in 2019, and then I had a trip before that, that was 2002, and then interviews in, in Ukraine and in Sweden. Uh, so it was finished, it was published in 2020, right? Yeah, and, uh, but since that time, actually, a lot of things changed. And uh, first was the pandemic, and we thought that this is the worst, but then there was like full scale war in Europe now. Actually, the Russian. pandemic is mentioned in the book. It, it, yeah, I, I had, it's uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. managed to. We had a, one but thing about the pandemic. It was another proof that Ukraine has has changed in a way that Russia hasn't. It was that they were very quick to give out accurate figures on how many people who had uh, received the the coronavirus and and uh, COVID. So there were. But democratic in that sense. Yeah, but anyway, I mean, a lot of things changed during like like yeah. last Sorry. two day, two uh, years already, and this full scale war, Russian war in Ukraine. And um, what do you think? I mean, is your book is still relevant actually? Uh, yeah, in in the sense that yes, because it it uh, it does. If you look at the title, it says Ukraine Ukraine adrift, or in Svenska, in Swedish uh, Ukraina på drift. It is about a country that is drifting west westwards, and that's exactly what's happening now. I mean, it is certainly breaking up, uh, possibly permanently. I don't know uh, from from its uh, belonging to another eastern sphere. Mm -hmm. But I think it could, uh, of course, the, you know, over over twenty or thirty years, maybe it could reconnect to, to, to uh, the historical ties it has, because it does have very strong cultural and uh, popular ties to, to the Russian uh, uh, culture, of course. Okay, but what, what so you would rewrite, for example, in your book right now, you think, yeah, I should do something differently? Something but differently, yeah. Well, I would like, I should have, uh, uh, I should have visited Mariupol, which I didn't, uh, that would be great. And, um, but otherwise, fact-wise, uh, the, there's nothing in major ha has changed. When it came out in English, the English version of the book, it came out, it was now in, in November, and I was criticized in Brussels because there was a, a woman there who said, what I don't like about your book is that you portray Zelensky as being a good man or having good intentions. But I mean, he's just as corrupt a bastard as the others. So. Uh, there was somebody who said that, but now, uh, you know, three months after that, the war broke out and Zelens uh, Zelensky was thrown into this role of being a, a hero uh, to the rest of the world. So now it stands up better. That uh, as, uh, Yeah, it feels as, like absolutely two different people now, yeah. before and after. And yeah. yeah, it's like how many people criticize Zelensky inside the country, I mean, among Ukrainians, of course. Yeah. But now people are, yeah, he's kind of hero anyway, but... Uh, yeah, we will see how it will run, but it's very interesting. Phenomena, but, person, I would say. But that's a situation of many times. What makes you a hero is something not necessarily uh, decided by your personal uh, uh, traits, but also the situation in which you work yeah. um, or act. But you mentioned about Mariupol, and, but you have been in Kharkiv. Kharkiv, and yeah. What was your impression about the city? I mean, this is the biggest city in uh, in Ukraine, and uh, it's now like bombing every day, and uh, almost like half of the city is already destroyed by, by Russian occupants. Yeah, I I, I assumed it would be it. Uh, I had read about uh, Kharkiv uh, quite a lot, and I assumed it would be more. It had wouldn't have been one. It was one of those industrial, heavy industry towns with making of uh, uh, tractors and. Uh, 
and, uh, and airplanes and military equipment uh, and heavy industry. And it used to be the, the capital of Ukraine for a couple of years. But uh, it, it turned out a lot more of a charming uh, international town, uh, the uh, university town that I imagined. Uh, so I, I was very, it's one of the really nice towns to visit. And uh, I met people who also said this, uh, we had a discussion about being a, uh, if it had European values and this man who said it has, yes, this is very much a European town. Uh, uh, although it's very uh, far in the east, but he, he was referring to the openness of Kharkiv. Yeah, and um, um, I think that will be my last question, but um, more about the Swedish situation. Now Sweden has a new government, and I think it's in its power to strengthen support um, of Sweden to Ukraine, uh, especially in the focus of military support. What do you think about that? I mean. Uh, it's the support should be bigger than before, and in, in which terms, and what do you think in general about that? Yeah, I, well, I hope the, the support will be bigger and will increase, and n perhaps not only increase, but be consistent and keep over for a long time, because that's the only, one to, only way to win this war. It's not by crushing the Russians, but to tire them, to make them tired, and in the end just say, let's go home. Thank you both so much, and I really hope that uh, all together, like Ukraine, Sweden, and all the democratic countries, um, we will win this war against uh, Russian occupants. And um, and also, I want to tell um, to share with you that uh, you can actually buy autographed um, book of Paul uh, Frigges. Just like he left in the corner, it's a silk uh, stand, and um, you can have it in English or in uh, Swedish language. And you can also uh, talk with Paul and ask him questions, and that would be a lot of fun and uh, to talk with you. So just go straight left, and uh, you will see the um, uh, silk uh, corner with uh, uh, books. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.